thank you. Is there any study which compares uh, the uh, uh, your uh, long acting FSH to HMG to highly purified HMG right from day two? Yeah, the question was. HMG from day two against Elonva. I mean, this is exactly uh, my criticism about the projected trial. I mean, switching to HMG after the Elonva is not really comparing uh, FSH all the way. Uh, a study might be done using HMG from day two all the way in antagonist cycle versus Elonva. For seven days, switching to HMG compared the two groups. In my mind, it will be a, a maybe a pure uh, way to look at it. I have uh, some politics or whatever behind the scene. I will not go into this, but we, we've heard uh, the potential benefit of LH in poor valve responders. And there might be a reason to give this LH activity throughout the follicular phase, not only uh, after seven days. Now, we are all aware of the fact that the LH activity in the uh, uh, highly purified HMG preparation is mainly derived from HCG, which is long acting. So it's not that you give a bolus of LH, so to speak, that is short acting. You have the whole follicular phase exposed to a given amount of HCG, actually, which gives you the LH activity for the patient. And maybe in the poor round responders, this will be more important than the uh, everyday normal responders that will do with the uh, Elonva just as well as compared to the uh, HMG. Yeah. But this is, a, of course, a good point, but, you know, it's another study. And, and I don't see, uh, uh, look, the uh, ENGAGE study, for example, was more than 1,500 patients. This is incredibly huge study to do. I mean, it costs fortune. I don't see a company comes out with the money to do a study that you... you, you uh, you suggest, but you're absolutely correct. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things you said that high dose FSH in the early phase may be responsible for not getting good results. Could it be because we are not getting it physiological? Because normally, when we are giving physiological two cell uh, to gonadotropin theory, we get FSH induces FSH receptors and then LH receptors. So probably that is going haywire a little bit. If we are giving very high dose initially, FSH uh, doses. Well, th this is also a, a, a good question. But uh, look, uh, it depends. Uh, the poor valve responders can be prepared previously, as we heard, by oral contraceptives or by estradiol or progesterone, etc. And it has to do with the initial LH uh, uh, level in the uh, poor responder uh, serum as, as we start the stimulation in the early follicular phase. And there, it, it plays a role there, uh, I would say. So again, uh, the, uh, the role of following LH levels during the follicular phase was discussed previously. May, maybe in these particular patients, it'd be more uh, significant to know where we are and to tailor the uh, gonadotropin to the uh, given LH that we see in the early uh, follicular phase. But also maybe Professor Zeidman and uh, Dr. Atta would like to join me and uh, uh, also uh, answer questions about the uh, um, uh, Elonva uh, subject. Actually, I have another thought that in the older women above 37 or in proven poor responders who make just two or three follicles, has anybody tried giving two injections of 150 simultaneously to the patient? On I'm, sure, I'm sure Professor Zeidman did because he's a man of courage. I didn't do so far, so. Uh, there's no study looking at it. I know of several, I, I haven't tried it either, but I know that several doctors have tried it, but again, this is just incidental report. Also, another question is, should we use a long vein in an, in an agonist cycle, okay, if it has such good effect? And I've been starting to collect cases, but I, again, we don't have enough data. Unfortunately, uh, since pharma companies control the studies because they're so expensive, they have no interest in, in you know, moving ahead products which they, they 
they are not going to benefit from. So that's really a bias we have in current uh, knowledge. Yes, the several studies published looking at progesterone uh, rise uh, both in poor responders and in normal responders, and uh, there's not a big difference uh, overall. But, uh, but there's actually good data published on that. Good afternoon, Dr. Atta. Please pardon my ignorance, but can you please uh, again tell me how do you decide on the dose of, uh, of your product? How do you decide the starting dose? Well, the, the, again, the starting dose is... is uh, of the ANOVA is based on the weight, and uh, as was mentioned, age should be considered too, and also your experience with the, uh, the response of the patient, because if you know if, uh, that the patient doesn't respond well or overstimulates, you can adjust. Later on, from, uh, when you start the monitoring from around day seven or eight, usually you, it's just as you would usually do. I mean, you'd give daily injections according to uh, your assessment of the response so far and on your previous experience. Do you want to add something? Not exactly the same thing, but I want to make actually two, two, two remarks. Firstly, there is a, a regarding poor responders, there was a presentation at ASHRAE by Dr. Kolbianakis. They, they reported, it's not published yet, they reported a small randomized control trial of non-inferiority in terms of number of oocytes collected in patients who were poor responders who were given ELONVA versus 450 units of daily recombinant FSH. Okay, and the samples, by the same sample sample size calculation, they decided they would only need actually, what, 20 something patients in each arm. And the study overall recruited some 40 patients. It's a small size, but I mean adequately sized for non-inferiority as they defined it. They define non inferiority as one and a half oocytes difference. Okay. And they define poor response as women who yielded less than five oocytes in a prior cycle despite 400, 450 units of daily recombinant FSH. It's not an you know, orthodox description. But what they observed is actually women given ELONVA had the similar number of oocytes collected. There wasn't increased either. Okay, so the, me the median number of oocytes collected in women given ELONVA was 2.5. The, in the other arm, who were given 450 units day, day recombinant FSH, the median number was 2, and p-value is 0.3. Okay, so it, it doesn't seem to be superior. But I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not worse off either, but you know, we need to read the full text thing. Okay? Regarding giving two injections at the same time, I mean, these, these pharmacokinetics things is, you know, a bit complicated. It's been many years after medical school. I mean, when you read these papers in detail, it, it follows first-degree absorption and pharmacokinetics. So initial dosage is actually, you know, as you overshoot the therapeutic threshold, you know, whether it, you take it further high, you know, doesn't really change, you know, the, the extent of stimulation in a way. But, I mean, if you're talking about consequent, I mean, like subsequent administrations, you know, that, is, that, is, that may be something to look at, though. And I 100% I, I, I agree, you know, with, you know, the proper comparison would be, you know, with either menotrophins, you know, or recombinant FSH plus recombinant LH versus ELONHUA in, in poor responders. Excuse me, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to make another comment because previously when we used to give these lectures, we used to say uh, along about 60 milligrams is like 200 units of recombinant every day. Then the company came out and said, well, actually, it's not like 200, it's like 300. So they changed their own mind. And uh, this is perplexing before you start using it because the first question you say, uh, what, what is the equivalence of giving this dose? Now, in poor responder patients, my experience with, with quite a lot of patients, many dozens, is that at least you, could, you get a similar response to 450 units a day. And again, one injection, and because if I was listening to the company, I would expect if a patient in a previous cycle had five eggs with 450 every day, as was quoted in the Nashua study, now when I give a long while, I'll have less. But no, actually, from my experience and from these preliminary studies, it's as though you gave... Uh, 450. And this is exa exactly as my colleague explained, because you p you're probably reaching the threshold. And I've seen doctors, especially in India, give 
you know, 12 amp ampules of uh, menagon daily and so on. And most doctors now believe that the threshold probably somewhere between 300 and 450 daily. So uh, it doesn't really matter if you give 450 or 900 or 1,000. And that's also a good answer about uh, why few of us have tried giving two injections. So uh, I think this is a very important point and also a bit confusing because you can't really parallel an ONVA to a daily dose of uh, recombinant FSH in a precise manner. This is to Dr. Uh, Boris. Uh, you, Boris, uh, you said that one third of the patients will reach uh, the day of SCG the first dose itself. Now, in these patients, how about the endometrium? Will they so quickly go uh, to the maturation and how, what was the difference? That's, that's a great question. You may consider you know, a follicular phase, I mean, less than seven days as a short follicular phase. And there's a recent paper published by Dr. Tomasevich from, I, I mean, I don't remember exactly his country, but I mean, they, they reanalyzed engaged trials data, which included, you know, these 1,500 patients. So they divided patients according to, you know, the day of HCG injection. So this one-third of patients in the ELONVA arm who met HCG criteria after one injection, and 42% of patients in the recombinant FSH arm who met, you know, HCG criteria in the same time period, seven days or earlier, okay? So when they compared the clinical outcome of these women with women who met HCG criteria later on, who you would call normal follicular phase, the pregnancy rates are the same, okay? Uh, but I have one reservation for this analysis. A small minority, I mean, I don't know what percentage, I don't have the data, but I mean, some patients who were included in this normal follicular phase arm would be actually extended late responders, okay? Because, I mean, the, 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 the highest number of days is like 18 reported in the trial. So I would say, you know, I would like to see, you know, a comparison between women who met HCG criteria in seven days or less versus women who met HCG criteria, you know, in between eight to 14 days or something, who is the normal, you know, more or less. I mean, there's no strict definition, okay? But even given, you know, so far the data as the paper they published, I think it was published in RBM, okay? So the, the pregnancy rates are not significantly different. So it's, it's not worse at the moment. And you said there is a delayed HCG response. Yes, they, 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 they give HCG. HCG response is there. In that case, suppose a patient comes to day six, you've been given this long acting, and day six patient comes, and you are not, not seen that response. And you've been adding your gonadotrophins there. And suddenly you see on, say, maybe day eight, uh, you know, the patients are responsive, more responsive. Is it is it going to happen like this in the delayed uh, HCG response? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't get the question exactly. See, you said that uh, it, it could be a delayed HCG response in that long acting. So sometimes you don't see the response on day six when the patient comes. So it could be day eight. And now day six when the patient comes, we are adding the gonadotrophins to the patient. Um, the gondotrophin injections, yeah, you're talking about additional gondotrophin additional injections. Uh -huh. You yes. start them, you know, on the eighth day, actually. I mean, so the first seven days is corifolitropin only. Oh, okay. Okay? okay. And you start giving additional FSH injections starting from stimulation day seven and on. There's flexibility. I mean, you could do this by a fixed protocol like when we started out with antagonists, but you can do it with a very flexible uh, protocol. Like if I have a poor responder, I actually start monitoring early, and I, st I sometimes on day five, I, like if I gave her the long one on day two, and then on day five I st see that the hormones are still very low, I can start adding the good twins on day three. So you can be flexible here, and if you have a, a good responder patient, you probably would not be adding any uh, recombinant FSH at all, just giving an antagonist so she doesn't, so you can extend the, the follicular phase. So uh, it's very flexible, and, and, you, and you need experience. You know, often when you have a new drug, people say, oh, this is going to be easier. It's actually in the beginning harder because you have to learn, you know, how, how to customize your treatment. But, but it's, it's a really great drug once you get used to uh, playing along with the flexible protocol. At least that's my experience. Uh, 
I have a slightly different question than Dr. Gautam Alabadia. In a uh, poor responder or a slow growing follicle cases, can we repeat the uh, long acting FSH? Well, uh, first, uh, of course, uh, once you have the first cycle and you see how the patient responds, then you, have, you can change or modify the approach for the next time. Of course, you can use the uh, uh, recombinant long-acting FSH in the next cycle uh, if you have a good response in the previous one. But then again, you might see that m changes might be done, for example, we spoke about HMG, we spoke about adding LH, et cetera, et cetera. This is why uh, we need flexibility and we need individualization here. My, my question is in the same cycle, can we repeat? In the same cycle, same if cycle, we can yeah. repeat the Alonva in the same cycle. Well, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I would, I would uh, say it would be extremely hard to predetermine or to predict uh, the follicular dynamics uh, once you consider giving the second uh, injection because it, it takes it for granted that you don't foresee HCG situation, giving the HCG for the next seven days. I mean, and, and you may be extremely wrong in that because the follicular dynamics can change. It doesn't go by the book. You know, there are patients who are slow growers of follicles and then they reach a point where the follicular growth is, is exponential. So you might risk the, the case where the system is overloaded with FSH while, while you are giving the HCG trigger. This, in my mind, might give you low quality oil sites and also may affect the luteal phase in a way that we don't really know. So it's, it's an interesting uh, thought, but I would be hesitant to do that. If it is on day six and you find that it has reached the trigger level, how many days of antagonist will you give by after with withholding further FSH? Again, as I said, it's very, very flexible, but uh, unusually it's about three to four days of uh, antagonist before you can trigger, but it's very, very individual. I mean, some patients react really strongly to a long, but that's why I said be very careful. If you, if you are not familiar with the response of the patient, you might get really surprised. And, and again, there's no on-off switch. So you, finally you find yourself a patient that already has 15,000 uh, picomol per liter uh, of uh, estradiol and you know that the next two days she's going to climb up because you have no way. So it's true that if you try that start the antagonist it might slow slow a bit the stimulation but you have no control. And if, again in the days now that you can use an agonist trigger uh, at least you can fall asleep at night but I would be very careful when using the LONVA in good response patients and uh, I agree that giving two injections will not give you the ability to individualize the, the treatment so much. So, uh, I mean, but, you know, the patients that love it the most are the ones that have one injection and that's it, and uh, maybe three injections of antagonists. So to answer your question, usually most patients, four, four, three to five days of antagonists are sufficient to reach the point where the follicles are well developed. Without giving further uh, FSH? Only no, that, that, that's in the good response, but a third of the patients will not need any further recombinant FSH, but uh, two-thirds two of the other patients will need. But again, usually not extensively. I mean, two, three, four days uh, of additional uh, recombinant FSH. So it's, it's, it's really a very friendly treatment, and again, it's a matter of cost. In, in, in our country, they were smart enough to the cost identical to seven days of a combinant FSH. They, they knew we'd probably not use it otherwise. So for us, it's actually we are neutral from the cost issue. And uh, uh, so again, for most patients, this is very good. And especially poor responder patients, they actually save money because they inject such huge amounts daily. If you have a patient that before you were planning to give a 600 uh, units of uh, even menotropines, it, it still might be cheaper to give her just a daily one injection for, to cover five, six days. So very, very useful.